And the working title, I have two working titles. One is, could be called Barrio Art Risings. Instead of Barrio Arising, you have the T in there, so it's Barrio Art Risings. Another could still be New York and Vanguards. It'll depend on, on the publisher. The, um, the publisher uh, at, at this time, it will be uh, uh, Notre Dame Press. So we're gonna discuss that a little bit. Um, the objective of the book is to demonstrate that Puerto Rican artists in New York created a network of artist-run community-based galleries throughout New York, and that their collective efforts constitute a movement that is intertwined with these, these many factors, but these are the big ones, right? Social political movements to empower Puerto Ricans and other peoples considered ethnic, racial, not rational, racial and gender minorities in the USA, movements to revitalize urban areas and reform at the educational system, and the alternative art movement in New York. That's very important to me as an art historian. I'm in fact, I'm not a social scientist, although um, coming to this movement, I wasn't really able to use many of the conventional art history books. You know, we're not, in, in, we're not mentioned in, in most, in any histories, really, of of uh, modern and postmodern art, except in one area, which is in relationship to the Art Workers Coalition, and I'll show you a book there. But there, lately, a number of scholars have been um, do, reworking the history of the 1970s. Feminist scholars looking more at the women's movement and how it's influenced not only women, but artists in general. Um, Latino artists, Chicano artists um, have been looking at the 1970s and also um, the, the um, historians that I'm closer to in, in New York all deal with this notion of the collective. So the first major book in which I think many of our institutions ha uh, have been mentioned is called Alternative Art New York. That's by Judy Alt who um, was, is, a, is an artist and a theoretician and um, also ha was part of an artist collective in the in the 1970s, uh, 19 in the 1980s. Um, and within this, it's sort of like a chronology in which many Puerto Rican uh, institutions appear, and some important ones don't appear. Uh, I was very surprised, for example, that Chajas El Bojillo. Some of you may know that it was an important. Um, uh, public school. It looked a lot like Puerto de Soto Vélez or um, or um, Julia de Burgos today. It was in a public school on 9th Street in uh, the Lower East Side. It wasn't mentioned as an artist, which was very odd since she actually lives on the Lower East Side, but for some reason it didn't make it in. So um, big omissions like that are still quite possible, even though um, there was a big movement to save Chajas and Bojillo. It had like about 24 artist studios. It was the first um, exhibition space where, where Juan Sanchez curated a show in, in New York. It was so supported by the Low East Side community and yet it doesn't make it in the book. Why wouldn't it make it in the book? Because along with being, for example, having an artistic component, it also had a lot of community-based um, organizations within that school. And what I often find with, my, with art historians is that, and even funders, because I was at the Grant Makers for the Arts recently, is that when artists do a lot of social activism or there's some sort of a hybrid between like a nursery school and a school and an art studio, and a lot of these hybrid kinds of organizations um, scare people off. They don't quite know what to do with it. And, and as you know, I think we're, we're the masters of making hybrid organizations. Uh, so it becomes difficult for them and they tend to omit it. Or, um, I remember one, one colleague told me that, you know, they still weren't sure if Puerto Rican organizations, if people there still spoke English. And so they weren't sure about putting them into like, you know, a United States chronicle because they're Puerto Rican and they speak Spanish and I don't know, I don't feel comfortable talking about, about these organizations. So we still have that kind of stigma that we're somehow other and that our institutions are a little bit off, off the mark of what a conventional arts institution should be in New York City, which is just to show art and maybe some artist studios. There's a lot of social activism and community-based work that goes on in our organizations and 
it makes it difficult for some people to accept them as real arts organizations. So my thesis within this book is that I argue that the Puerto Rican art movement in New York was and continues to be guided by the ethos that the objective of, of art is to, quote, bridge gaps and build community. The reason that I came to this is often by looking at many, um, by listening to artists, in particular Wanda Ortiz, who did uh, two or three videos uh, recounting the history of art, uh, of Puerto Rican art and modern art. And um, she did it as, uh, in a, in a character uh, as an intern from the South Bronx, I uh, sometimes show the video, I won't. And part of what she says within, within that is that she sees her mission as bridging gaps and building community. And I've often heard artists say that when they talk about why they make art. And so that sort of resonated with everything I heard throughout the time I've, I've grown up. And I decided that I think that that is the right ethos rather than another framework which was um, resistance and affirmation. Um, in the 1980s and 90s, that was a framework that was often discussed about Puerto Rican art and Latino art in, in, in general. And what I find is that it's a little bit limiting uh, to consistently be in resistance. We're not, we're not in resistance. I think living in New York, being artists, there's a great desire to form community and to build different kinds of community even within an organization. So I think that overall, what has stood the test of time is this desire among artists to create a lot of different networks. Uh, the methodology. I employ an interdisciplinary approach that aims to integrate Puerto Rican artists into the canon of the history of art in the Americas, primarily focusing on New York. And I follow historians like uh, Stephen Watson, Michael Farrell, Greg Cholette, Alan Moore, who examine artistic collaborative circles. This is um, a, a relatively new kind of discussion in, um, in art history. Um, this is one of the books that you could read. It's called Collaborative Circles. And it's a little bit different than, than studies of movements. I don't know if you read in the New York Times this past Sunday, but the new curator of the permanent collection of MoMA said that she's changing the permanent collection, the way that it looks. Because she said, when you, when you think about isms, stylistic isms in art history, too many people are left out, too many artists are left out. And she's really trying to create a new kind of understanding of, of how artists relate to various kinds of movements, and it's not always about stylistic unity. In fact, one of the reasons I think that we've had a problem with understanding Puerto Rican art as, as a movement is, number one, it's citywide. All of these artists work in communities, Puerto Rican communities throughout the city. And usually when you think of a movement, you, you want to concentrate it in an area, right? You know, like the Soho scene, or, you know, or a Bushwick, or Dumbo. Okay, that's the art scene. And it's, even if it's, if it's not stylistically congruent, it's at least there, you know, geographically. Whereas our movement wasn't necessarily stylistically uh, the, the same, and it was spread throughout New York City, and it was also intertwined with very local kinds of initiatives. So what happens in El Barrio can or cannot look like what's happening downtown. And so my, my mission is to somehow create and to demonstrate that although these artists were living diff in, in different areas of the city, sometimes making work that didn't look similar, there was a consistent effort to show each other and to do this kind of networking. And it was often for that benefit of creating community, bridging the Puerto Rican community, bridging it to the island, bridging it to other communities. That's a very consistent uh, desire among these artists. And what I found as I started to look and look and look is to see that you know, even though Tayel is uptown, they're having shows downtown, and they're having shows in the Bronx, and there's a conversation that continues among this, this art, these artists, and that's passed down to other generations. So there's a consistency, and there's a consistency in outlook. Okay, so early manifestation. So the first, the, the reason I begin in 1964, many people ask me, well, you know, why are you beginning in 1964? And actually, uh, it's not so, it's, it's, 
because I am, you know, part of a conversation, many of us who are looking at uh, the 1960s begin in 1964, 1965. For example, this is 1964 to 1985. For the most part, when you talk about the alternative art movement in New York, you're really saying that it ends around 85, which is, um, you know, at the end of the first um, uh, term, Reagan's first term, right? <laughs> because he definitely decimated, he had to decimate these, these programs. And so uh, 65 to 85 is generally considered the time when the alternative art movement is happening in New York City. That also has to do, of course, with, in our situation with um, the dissemination of, the, of, of monies for the war on poverty, for social services, and for um, community control of schools. All of these conversations about community control uh, begin in the 1960s, and um, the war on poverty begins in 1964, uh, and the Civil Rights Act, and so money is poured into our communities at that time. So that's the Great Society Legislation Equal Opportunity Act. I just wanted to show you, you know, the signing of it. That might go in the book, just as like, you know, war on poverty. So the real Great Society. Um, an important early manifestation, what I call the first really Puerto Rican artistic manif manifesto, begins with a document called the Puerto Rican Community Development Project, which was um, overseen by Antonia Pantoja. And within it, it's a fascinating document to read because um, a speed up, it, it was signed by about at least 60 leaders in New York City of community organizations. And it was submitted to the Anti-Poverty Board for the purpose of beginning a citywide community act action program geared to the Puerto Rican community based on the idea that we have to um, eliminate poverty through, enri through enriching ourselves through the arts, as well as other programs about you know, dealing with economic development. But certainly, it was Antonia Pantoja's claim, as it was with Afri with and studying also with African Americans, that part of, of the, the, po the contributions to cyclical poverty <coughs> had to do with a disparagement of our culture and our ways of being. And so this, what's fascinating about this document is that as you read it, it sounds like a manifesto and not like some kind of a, a document submitted for funding. Consistently talks about the importance of dignidad. Dignidad, that Puerto Ricans believe that no matter, that the, even the poorest person has dignity. And um, it talks a lot about our uh, that we have a rich culture despite our poverty because as many of you, some of you may know, we were uh, pretty much the primary example in this country of the culture of poverty. And um, we were stigmatized as our culture contributing to our impoverishment. And so Antonia Pantoja's you know, reversal of that was that we have to actually, the, the problem is we're not getting enough of our, of our culture. If, if we were empowered to really learn about our, our history, to reclaim our dignidad as people, we are going to be able to enrich ourselves, our community, and the United States. So it was very much about bringing more culture, more pride to Puerto Ricans, so that they can so walk down the street with dignidad and treat other people accordingly. That was very much the idea here. Now, um, the reason I have Aspida up is, of course, the Aspida clubs were one of the most important elements of, of, of sort of getting the word out, right, about Puerto Rican pride, about giving back to community. And in fact, there were several people uh, throughout the time that I've interviewed um, leaders within uh, the Puerto Rican art movement in New York who were um, aspirantes um, and or who worked in these community-based organizations that were given money in the 1960s and 1970s via the PRCDP and other kinds of anti-poverty, anti-delinquency, which was a very big problem as well. So a speed up clubs sort of encourage those, those wonderful Puerto Rican kids who are in high school and who are looking to go to college. But you know, like the coolest people don't always go to college right out of high school. 
<laughs> so, you know, an artist may not be thinking, and that's like, you know, it was, it was a wonderful organization, but it, 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 it couldn't attract everybody, let's say, right? So there was, uh, what I'm showing you here is um, a, a portrait, a, a photograph of Chino Garcia. I don't know if you know who Chino Garcia is. He's one of the unsung heroes of the Puerto Rican, of the Puerto Rican art movement, a man who I admire very deeply, grew up on the Lower East Side was a, um, a member of a, of, a, um, of a gang. And in 1964, he had gone back to Puerto Rico because he was told that he had to leave Puerto Rico, he was gonna, die, he was gonna get killed. He was just tipped off. And his story, in fact, the early story of, of, of what he called the real white society is not in a history book. It's in a book called um, The Gang and the Establishment which ironically turned out to be a, 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 a book that was dedicated to demonstrating that it was a very bad idea to give um, youth groups and uh, Puerto Rican groups and these other kind of marginal groups anti-poverty funds because you know they do rather radical crazy things with it like helping the young lords establish themselves in New York. But to, you know, Chino what was very interesting about Chino when I talked to him is that he said that his, his dream was to be an architect. That's something that he wanted to do very much. And throughout his life, he's built institutions. So the first institution he created was called the Real Great Society, right? Lyndon Johnson had the Great Society. He said that he knew about it, Theta, that he was going to build a real Great Society on the Lower East Side with former members of, of the gangs that he belonged to. They were going to rebuild a different society and he had a lot of help from um, some social workers and they created some very interesting programs. And I don't have any um, photographs of it, but one person who has written a lot about it is Luis Aponte, Aponte Barres. Uh, Lessons from El Barrio, East Harlem Real Great Society, Urban Planning Studio, this is just the only, the only uh, evidence I have, besides the book, which doesn't really have photos, is this Life Magazine article about the Real Great Society. And I would have, in order to reprint it, I'm going to have to get permissions. But here you'll see that it made a big Life Magazine article about what, these, what they were doing on the Lower East Side, including establishing, this is really cool, this place called the Leather Bag on the lower east side of this cute Puerto Rican girl and, you know, a mini. So the idea was that they wanted to start small business. I think we all know this today, right? <laughs> small businesses by artistic people. They had a little um, discotheque as well for a while. And um, after a while, they got into education and their, their um, program was called the University of the Streets. And that was begun around 1965, 1966. And the idea was that people could sign up uh, and um, on a bulletin board, and if you had something, if you wanted to learn something, you, you wrote it down, and if somebody had something to teach, you also wrote it down. They had a building, and it's still there on the Lower East Side. The Real Great Society building is still there. There was also a karate school, as usual. There were artist studios. And um, for a while, the University of the Streets was quite popular. Um, and it got so popular, they did receive a, a, a grant of about $30,000 by the Vincent Astor Foundation. And people started to hear about it. So uptown, there was a man named Angelo Giordani, another uh, former uh, gang member, who began to read about what Gino was doing. And he said, I would like to start the Real Great Society in El Barrio, and that became the Real Great Society of town. It had a very different um, sort of, it, it kind of had a different mission, because Angelo Giordani really wanted to, um, to sort of empower the Puerto Rican community. The Lower East Side, as you know, is an immigrant community, it's very diverse. And Chino himself has never seen, has never necessarily saw himself only as empowering Puerto Ricans. He's always seen himself as empowering the you know, working class and poor people in New York City. So although he's Puerto Rican, proud to be Puerto Rican, he really has consistently said 
that that was not in his mind to only be supporting the community. Angela Giordano, Giordano was quite different. And he also thought about it because of the connections between El Barrio and Columbia University to think, think about starting an urban planning institute. This was fascinating, right? So you had him, because he went to Harvard, make these connections with urban planners who really wanted to revitalize El Barrio in the 90s. In, we're talking the late 1960s, 1967, 1968, 1969, when Luis Aparez was part of this early coalition. And they started to work uh, very seriously on demanding a community, a community voice in the restructuring of El Barrio. And, in, and they tried to get um, the bid for, to, to create Baino Towers. So Taino Towers was actually part of, of, of that era. The other um, thing that they did was they started a school called East Harlem Prep. And um, I was told that Pedro Pietri was um, part of the teachers in East Harlem, East Harlem Prep. I'm not, I don't know if that's true. I can't talk to him now, um, except by dreams. <laughs> but, um, but um, they did start that. And as all of you who are familiar with the Young Lords, uh, the story of the Young Lords, there were uh, Young Lords at Columbia University, there was all of that activism. And there was a connection between RGS, Real Rights Society Urban Planning Studio, and some of the activists, Puerto Rican activists at Columbia University, including David Gonzalez. So the second part of the book it's going to look at what, you know building an activist community in Barrio, and here we're going to talk about the Young Lords and the Real Great Society Uptown, and these are some of the wonderful posters that we have in our collection. Um, when I presented this at uh, NYU, I had some of the students actually see Pedro Pietri reciting uh, the Puerto Rican obituary in this avant-garde movie called El Pueblo Se Levanta. And I talked a lot about the takeover of the First Spanish Church, not only as an action, but also really as a happening. Because there was poetry, there was art. There was, it was not simply a takeover, but there were other cultural manifestations that happened within it. And the way that El Pueblo Se Levanta portrays it, you really get the sense that this was something that was absolutely mind-blowing for people and very empowering and actually importantly important cultural component and we all know of course that some of the young lords were poets right so um, the poetry was always important now one of the things that I haven't been able to find out is who created the posters and I'm going to uh, be emailing Denise Oliver because unlike for example the Black Panthers who um, if you saw an exhibition at the um, new museum recently the Black Panther exhibition um, uh, this man named Emery, his last name is Emery, uh, created most of the posters. These posters are not signed by any one person, so that is a mystery as to you know how you credit this this work. That becomes one of the issues when I'm dealing with this time period. Sometimes things are not signed, and certainly lots of things are not dated. That's a big problem for me. Um, I'm showing you uh, actually a, the, a um, poster of a retrospective exhibition featuring uh, the work of photographer Hiram Marestari, who um, I, was, I was told was um, a member of the Young Lords and part of the security, head of security, but he also photographed quite a bit. And this is in our collection. Um, and if you notice, and here's when we're going to get into how do you connect the dots. You see that this is an exhibition at the Caribbean Culture Center. And one of the things that I trace is how these activists continually participate in so many other of our organizations. Hina Maristani was also the interim director of El Museo del Barrio in uh, 1975. He was very much, he was, well, before that, I mean, he was actually part of the first staff of El Museo del Barrio. So that we see these wonderful connections of artists really going into different, uh, different organizations and taking on different roles of, but also bringing in that ethos of, of building community and bridging gaps. 
So the first sort of big chapter is building a bridge to, to Puerto Rico. And here we're talking about, this is the way that I really see how the collectives around El Barrio function. And they really saw themselves, I think, for the most part, as building this bridge between these islands. So it would be El Museo del Barrio, the Puerto Rican Art Workers Coalition Society of the Friends of Puerto Rico, Tayel Boricua, the Oyel Campeche Gallery. This is an interesting story for me. What, because much of my information is through artists. And um, I, I tend to just not question very often you know, what they tell me. And so um, Oyel Campeche Gallery is very, very rarely mentioned by the artists as having any kind of importance. The Oyel Campeche Gallery was, part, was um, run by the Migration Division. Of, of the um, of Puerto Rico, just originally on Forty First Street. You know the migra do, you, do people mm -hmm. know what the Migration Division was? Okay, the Migration Division was set up, I believe, in 1946. Um, and when? Well, okay, you, you say a little, say, later, but that's a little 1951. Uh, never mind. Okay, so the Migration the Migration Division was was set up by the government of Puerto Rico to aid and assist the, the, the great migrations of, of Puerto Ricans who were coming here to work. And um, this gets back to like a lot of power struggles that you have to deal with that I sometimes are not evident when you read something. Antonia Pantoja was, in fact, the Puerto Rican Community Development Project was created in some ways to take away the, the, the um, the overall power that the migration division had within Puerto, you know, to sort of address Puerto Rican issues, right? I mean, when people, when, when, when people in the city wanted to hear what the Puerto Rican communities had to say, the migration division would be sort of the first stopping point. Yes. Uh, wasn't that also called, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, the Office of the Commonwealth of Puerto Rico? Yeah, sure. Oh, okay. Okay. We just call it here the Migration Division for short. I'm sorry, but yes. So um, they had a lot of clout within Puerto Rican politics as to how the m monies would be sort of divided among Puerto Puerto Ricans, they were the first stop. Now the Center for Puerto Rican Studies is the first stop, right? <laughs> we, we wish, right? We wish we could, we could do that. But um, so Antonia Pantoja, in fact, had some competitiveness with the, with the Migration Division. So within that, when I read her, the Migration Division is like, you know, that. Some of the de Puerto Rico that are trying to like manage us, and that's what I would hear. You know, the migration divisions. No, no, esa gente no. But when I was downstairs with um, another scholar named uh, uh, named Aldo uh, from from uh, Rutgers, he was looking at all the migration division files, and he said, "Aren't you looking at the migration division?" And I was like, well, I don't know, you know, nobody ever really talks about them. I just felt that they were like stigmatized, that I would get in trouble if I even mentioned them, to be honest. Like, you know, why are you, why are you giving, you know, credit to Alegría, esa gente? So I decided, you know, Aldo was like, check it out. And I'm pretty open. So I was like, okay, let me see what they had. And they had a treasure trove of things, in, including um, a lot of documentation of the early history. So this, this little gallery began in 1972, um, and there was a great desire, you know, I, I read it in the documents, to connect. But in some ways, already you had a Musa del Barrio and the Puerto Rican Art Workers Coalition, so in some ways we can say that they were really following the trend rather than starting it in terms of creating this, this, this gallery. Um, so we have Taller Borico, Ayer Campeche, and the Art Heritage of Puerto Rico, 1973, which is a sort of a culminating um, exhibition uh, that uh, for me is it like caps a certain part of this movement. So let me just take you through this. Uh, Society of Friends of Puerto Rico, Galleria Oi. That's another um, institution that in ninth, that was really the first institution and um, very different in, in some sense. Um, 
because it was one of the few that was paid that that um, had a wealthy patron. Our, our organizations, for the most part, have been created by artists, by working class artists, by cobbling together public funds. But uh, Mrs. Uh, uh, Guerrero uh, um, was uh, Guerrero, excuse me, was actually married to a, a wealthy uh, businessman, and in 1968 she got ninety thousand dollars from from one of her friends in Puerto Rico to to purchase a building on uh, East twenty uh, in the twenties, Second Avenue, and began. A, uh, an artist space. Before that, Society of Friends of Puerto Rico dates back to 1956. But um, it was basically very, they put on little art fairs and readings. Uh, their offices were in the Statler Hilton Hotel. But in 1968, she buys this, this former Catholic school and begins to um, have contemporary art exhibitions. And that's really the first place where um, the Puerto Rican Traveling Theater had its headquarters. So again, you have a multidisciplinary space where you have musicians, you have a theater, you have artist studios, and you have an art gallery. And that really becomes a sort of a paradigm that we continue to follow. We want it all in one. Now, another person that comes into the uh, play in the 1960s, sort of out of left field, literally, is Rafael Montañez Ortiz, the founder of the Museo del Barrio. Rafael Montañez Ortiz uh, is an ism. He was the found. He was one of the voices for the destructivist movement, destructivism in in the arts. And really, by 1963, he was already in the in the collection of the Museum of Modern Art. He was uh, avant-garde, very much part of the avant-garde artist. In 1966 or seven, he went to London to participate in the uh, destructivist, uh, an international destructivist art. Uh, conference, and um, one of the great, I've had many conversations with him, and what was astounding to me was I said, well, you were part of this avant-garde scene, what, what, it, what were you doing every day? And he said, I was a teacher at the, um, at the high school of music and art. I was like, you are a teacher, right? Yeah, because I always imagine that if you're like a big time artist and you're in the avant-garde, why would you want to be a school teacher? And he told me this story this, that he had been denied entry to that school because he was Puerto Rican. And it's a story that happened to me too, actually. Um, I wanted to go to a specialized high school. This is 1973. And they told my mother, you know, she can't go there. And I'm like, why? And they just told her, well, she'll be better off because if she goes there, she'll be competing with really sm all the really smart kids. I want to go to Dewey. But if you keep her at Lafayette, she'll be a star. And my mother believed it. And so I, was I, I wasn't um, allowed to transfer or to even try to transfer. And so that resonated with me so much. And when he told me that story that the guidance counselor said he could not go to that school. They would not let him take the test, and he had to go to some industrial arts high school. Um, it really made a big difference in his life. He went. He's a he's a veteran. You know, he was in the Korean War. He was a map maker. He comes back and he starts to do his his um, bachelor's and master's at, at Pratt, and he thinks a lot about um, primitive art and ritual and how that can empower people and, and give people some insight. So that's the, that's, the work comes out of, out of that, it comes out of surrealism, it comes out of process art. At the same time, he, he said that he wanted to be in the schools to give other kids like him hope. And the way that El Museo del Barrio started, according to his account, was that this is during the time where people are, are really, um, advocating for Puerto Rican and Black Studies to be instituted throughout the school system. There were, there were some high school students that wanted to have a Black and Puerto Rican art class. He was championing that. 
superintendent from Harlem calls him and says, you know, we, we are trying to create a, a, a program in, for the Puerto Ricans in, 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 in the Harlem area, because it wasn't like the, in East Harlem School District at the time. It was just Harlem. And he said, okay. Now what we don't know, but what was going on at the time as well was the Art Workers Coalition. He was a member of that. He was a member of many kind of radical groups. Fluxus, these were anti-war groups. These were war, uh, groups, uh, artist groups that wanted to support civil rights. And the Art Workers Coalition, this is one of several, this is a new book that just came out on the Art Workers Coalition. Um, a lot of people are re-looking at that time now. Um, Rafael is probably not necessarily in this, sadly. I mean, but he was prominent within, within that as a, a person who advocated for black and Puerto Ricans. There were African Americans, the most important uh, of which was uh, Tom Lloyd and Faith Ringgold. They were both very, they, they saw them, they, Tom Lloyd and Rafael Montañez Ortiz were sort of like the people of color spokesmen within the Art Workers Coalition. And that's, um, El Museo del Barrio, it was founded in 1969, and he said that when he went up to the um, district, they said, we want you to create this art, this enrichment program, and he said, no, I want to create El Museo del Barrio. I want to create Un Museo del Barrio. And I said, where did you get that idea? By that time, by 1968, already, Studio Museum had been founded. The difference between El Museo del Barrio and the Studio Museum, however, has to do with the fact that that museum was founded by a sort of coalition between artists and some board members from the Museum of Modern Art. It always had affiliations to the mainstream. El Museo del Barrio, very different orientation. It comes from public funding of actually for, school, for the schools. It comes out of a school budget. So right then and there has a different orientation and a different mission. And in the beginning it was really looked at as a museum to gear towards enriching students. I have many interviews. Sure, it's all downstairs. All of the interviews that I've done with artists, um, I have about 35. So, this is a picture of the Puerto Rican Art Workers Coalition. At, at the time that Prof. Montenegro Ortiz goes up to El Barrio, he, he relates, and other people have confirmed that he went around, he went to visit the Young Lords, but he found the most support from the, peop from the architects that were part of the Rio Great Society uptown. And um, what's not well known is that Mari Malbenitez was married. Mari Malbenitez, uh, as some of you may know, is a very prominent art historian and the director of the Escuelas de Artes Clásicas, which I hope will you know, still be there within a year's time. <laughs> um, well, she actually was um, co-director of the Museo del Barrio with Rafael Montañez Ortiz. And it's interesting that when you read her essays, she never really mentions that. So I found that out much later in discussions uh, with other artists that she did that. But for some reason, and I think it's, it's interesting that in Puerto Rico, among certain artists in Puerto Rico, their associations with, with the 1960s and 70s in New York are kind of downplayed. And they're downplayed for political reasons, I believe. You know, to, to be sure that, you know, they're seen as very much island-based. No van afuera, they're not trying to be mainstream, they're Puerto Rican. You know, so um, sometimes when you find out the back and forthness between the artists in Puerto Rico and here, and that is not mentioned, it's basically to downplay the importance of New York. Like, like Rafael Colón Morales. Yep. In front of mine. I love Rafael. I have, he's in here. Yeah, I love that guy. Totally. Great artist. Actually, Rafael Colón Morales is uh, a very prominent painting is, uh, is, is on view now at El Museo del Barrio in the permanent collection show. So what I want to show you is this whole thing. Black and Puerto Rican artists must be uh, represented. These are people that were um, 
This was a protest around 1970 in front of, at the Museum of Modern Art in front of the um, information exhibition. And I'm also showing you uh, that I found in a book in the 1940s. American artists demonstrating, right, um, in, in front of the Museum of Modern of modern art. Because what people sometimes don't understand is that protest is, is actually part of an artist's job. And for example, um, the abstract expressionists, there's a famous portrait of them called the Irascibles. And the fact they named it the Irascibles because a couple of weeks before that portrait was taken, they were demonstrating in front of the Metropolitan Museum of Art for ignoring American abstract artists. So there was a point in which being a white male artist, American artist in New York, was not a privileged position because the art world was so Eurocentric that you know European artists were really what were seen as part of the avant-garde. So it's it's always been part, I think, of, of artists from time to time to kind of demonstrate that there have been many kinds of omissions and prejudices. And so this idea of, of like protesting uh, the Museum of Modern Art has a long history, and it's not just minority artists that have done this kind of work. So. Um, Another reason that I'm showing you Luis Apante Pares, very interestingly enough, is that within his discussion, guess who Luis Apante Pares was? He helped incorporate Taller Boricua. Now, I found this in the Migration Division um, uh, papers, where Taller said they couldn't get me a copy of their incorporation papers, but it was actually there because of a cedogram. And so I was able to see who were the original incorporators. And they had always told me, for example, that the Rio Grande Society was very, very important to the founding of Tayel because they left them the building when they were defunded by the federal government uh, because of their association with the Young Lords. They had also apparently found some uh, offices for the Young Lords to begin activism in El Barrio. And, um, they gave that space to Tayel, and that's how Tayel Boricua was, was able to sort of have a space in El Barrio that they were looking for. So Luis, even though he's um, an architect, and all that, he does have a very important connection to Tayel, as did um, Manuel Neco Otero, who was another architect, who was another founding member of Tayel Boricua. He was and all of them became part. Manuel Negotero then later became the person who re restructured a brownstone where Museo del Barrio first came in. So all of these people, right, they're artists, they're architects, they're designers, and they're putting, the, you know, they have all these different functions. It's like they're gonna do what needs to get done to make this museum happen and to make these, these um, collectives and these art spaces happen. So it's, I'll, I'll, just outstanding work that they are able to multitask <laughs> the way that they did in those days. I'm just showing you, you know, um, the aesthetic, another Young Lord's poster in our collection, and this is a very famous poster by uh, Marcos, Marcos Dimas, and you can see sort of right um, how he's portraying the dances with the rifle that, with, that normally is not a way that the dances is portrayed, right? <laughs> Well, he's given them the Young Lord's look, that 1960s radical look. Another thing that I wanted to talk about in terms, when I, in, in the book, in terms of the, young, of the Young Lord and the Young Lords and the role that they played was that even the offices, this is a, a photograph from the Palante book, and the offices were covered with posters from the Instituto de Cultura de Puerto Rico. So they were functioning as effectively as an art gallery. Where else in El Barrio were you going to be able to see posters by Omar, by Maltorel, by Rafael Tufino? They were plastered right there in these offices. So I, you know, my contention is, is that the Young Lord's office was a political venue, but it was also in some ways an art gallery very much within the spirit of Tayel Boricua. And the residents, that, and um, they were actually across the street from each other at one point. Also, this is by Jorge Soto. This is an early um, 19, about 1972 or three. 
And here um, I discuss this in, in other essays as sort of um, the ethos of Taller Boricua, which is to make a connection to um, the, the Taino culture, pre-Columbian culture, to our inner African heritage. And what's often downplayed is, of course, the Spanish, right? And within there, you see a lot of symbols. You see the flag of Lares. Um, so in terms of the aesthetic of Taller, and you'll see it time and time again, is very much based on, on a sensibility of the afro Taino. That's what they brought to to New York, this sensibility, and, and it continues to this day among many of the artists that, fact, that have come out of the taller. Art Heritage of Puerto Rico, 1973. Um, I've written several, uh, two published essays on the importance of this exhibition. This was a collaboration between the Museo del Barrio and the Metropolitan Museum of Art, and seven or eight institutions in Puerto Rico, including the Institution of the Cultura de Puerto Rico, the Museo de Ponce, um, well, um, several, several, several others, the, gover the, the government of Puerto Rico itself, to do a 500, a, a show that spanned 500 years of Puerto Rico, of Puerto Rico. This was an outstanding exhibition that, uh, by this time, Marta Moreno Vega is the director of El Museo. And what I discuss within these essays are a couple of things. As you know, the Puerto Rican Art Workers Coalition and the Art Workers Coalition, as you saw, that they were um, demonstrating to, have, to recognize black and Puerto Rican and minorities in museums. This kind of activism made a very big impact on the institutions in New York. First of all, that's when you got these uh, hours, extended hours in museums. Museums used to close at 5 o'clock. The Art Workers Coalition said museums should be open 24 hours a day for working people. They finally got like a free night up until nine o'clock in major museums. That's one of the one of the games. Um, after a, a protest, actually a takeover of Thomas Hobbing's office, the director of the Metropolitan Museum was taken over by Rafa, by um, Rafael Montañez Ortiz. Uh, several of uh, Marco says he was there. It's documented in uh, Faith Ringel's uh, biography that they took over Thomas Holding's office. About a couple of months later, I, I saw actually within the, the Migration Division office, office memos that the, Museum of Modern, the, the Metropolitan Museum begins for the first time to offer um, Spanish, tours in Spanish of the collection and begins to make an attempt to connect with the Latino and Puerto Rican community. An outcome of that was the hiring of Irvin McManus a uh, very important uh, person in our community. Mm, the, probably the, the person who has the, mo the, the, I don't like to say the oldest, the, the most senior member of the um, board of El Museo del Barrio. And he was part of the education staff, and he really helped uh, El Museo in the beginning. They were demonstrating to get those kind of artifacts out of, out of the Museum of Natural History, out of the Museum of the American uh, Indian, out of um, the Metropolitan Museum's collections. And it was through his help that El Museo, when it was in the um, Brownstone on 116th Street, got the cases and tried to create, you know, inroads for El Museo to have these collaborations. And that's when, according to him and Malta, they came up with this idea to do this collaboration. And the outstanding thing about this collaboration was that they got the Metropolitan Museum to bring guards and to redo a series of storefronts with their money. Um, so, but what was left out were the artist activists that were, had tried, you know, who had brought this all into being. So Marcos Dean, none of the Taller artists except for Rafael Junior were a part of the exhibition. Rafael Mendez Ortiz was not part of the exhibition. And this exhibition was, began the first protest against El Museo del Barrio begun by Taller Boricua, which we know there are many other protests and, <laughs> and criticisms. But yes, it begins in 1973, the criticism that El Museo del Barrio is going to mainstream. Loisaida was going to be, I call it Bridge Between Las Razas, and, and here, you know, once the Real Great Society ended, uh, 
you've got um, Chino Garcia beginning a new organization called Chacas. And one of their first projects was a collaboration between themselves and this, uh, the, this uh, vision, visionary architect to create domes. Oh, God. This is. Can someone just remind me? Like the like yes. There's so many things I keep in my head. So, so yes, Buck Minister Fuller worked with a bunch of Puerto Ricans and African Americans in Lower East Side to think about alternative housing, the domes. Um, there's another book about Chacas. It's called the uh, the Dome Builders. Um, and as you know, the dome didn't take off, but community gardens did and casitas did. And so the next big project that Chad has initiated was La Plaza Cultural. It has always been a, a, a very uh, a community garden that incorporates art and it's part of like a groundswell of community activism in, in uh, the East Side. And then I talk about also during this time in this 1976, the explosion of community uh, gardens and Las Casitas. And this is a picture of Chata Cedogia, which closed in 1999, and, and um, that's the public school. And I wanted to include Juan Sanchez's exhibition, uh, Huellas, which uh, was the first introduction that I really had to, the, to activist art by Puerto Ricans. It made a very big impression on me. This was uh, done to, um, in, in honor of the Puerto Rican political prisoners very, very large group, group exhibition, and apparently it was the first exhibition he ever curated, and he has continued to cur curate very important <coughs> exhibitions since that time. Uh, Clemente Sotovela is sort of the last of the major institutions in um, Lower East Side. What you should know is that that building had already become a community institution in 1984. It had a number of community organizations within it. It continued to sort of go back and forth and now it's it's a, um, in, in terms of being both community organizations having some cultural little institutions within it and now it's fully fledged a cultural institution. And then we have um, the New Regan Village. Uh, that is, um, that was actually, we all know the New Regan Poets Cafe, right? But in fact, there was a, a, a different institution called the New Weekend, the New Weekend Village, that was quite important on the Lower East Side as well. And actually, um, Pedro Pietri and the Latin Insomniacs. What I found is that they they did many more performances, and he seemed to to gravitate more towards the New Weekend Village than he did to the New Weekend Village at that time. I also talked to Lily and Jimenez, and they told me that sort of like the New Weekend Village in their opinion was much more of the, um, the activist uh, co component of, of the Puerto Rican artists kind of gravitated towards that space. That's because it was founded by a former young lord. Um, and in 1974 also we have in Foco, the first uh, Puerto Rican uh, photography collective. <coughs> um, so they, they become really, well they're still in activity today, and that's Charles Biasini, uh, Roger Gavan, and Phil Dante, who uh, died last year. So in Soho, uh, one of the most, um, one of the things that's not known is that like the first, um, the United Graffiti artist was started by Hugo Martinez, a uh, Puerto Rican uh, student um, at City College. He wanted to be a sociologist, and so the first person to think about, hey, let's put graffiti on canvas, it happened at City College. He started a, a studio there for graffiti artists, and they had a show at the Razor Gallery. And that kind of brought to, my, brought to the attention of the mainstream the great um, potential of graffiti art. Uh, Fashion Moda kind of took up that cause uh, in the South Bronx in 1978. Uh, I think Longwood Art Center uh, continues has continued uh, that interest in graffiti and fine art. This was a recent exhibition. No. That's Fred Wilson. Those are, uh, that's, that's um, Fred Wilson, um, Edwin Ramaran, Betty Sue Hurt. Uh, these are all um, former curators at, at Longwood. And that is a sculpture by Mayer, who's a graffiti artist. This was an exhibition curated by um, Izo, which was um, 
graffiti 20 by 40, which was uh, 20 years of graffiti artists, you know, who like began back in the 1970s. And that's the Graffiti Hall of Fame that Izzo also did. So um, support for graffiti art, I think, has been very consistent in our community, even as the mainstream may or may not be interested in it. I think we've continued to show support for that kind of work. And then in Soho, we also had Photo Gallery, 1975, created by Adal Maldonado. We all know him as Adal. Um, he was making very surrealist work then. The Alternative Museum, founded by Gino Rodriguez, who actually was part of Enfoco, gave Enfoco uh, its name, but they had uh, some conflict uh, with the first exhibition. And so although he named it, he's not considered a founder. But he, he actually was quite instrumental to uh, the, well, he curated Dos Mundos, which was the first sort of exhibition. I often see like 1977 as like, you know, the Puerto Rican movement, it, the, the, the moment of like, you know, so many spaces, an explosion of Puerto Rican art and Puerto Rican power. But reading it now, today, again, it's also, the way that I read it, it's also Puerto Ricans opening the way to a dialogue with the Americas. Because what happens after 1975 is that, well, this is Galeria Tito and Galeria Monivivi. These are two other galleries begun by members of Taller Borigua in El Barrio. Here we have a, a, a poster by Elisam, who by 1978, had, uh, with Dilcia Pagan, had been in, imprisoned, accused of being members of the FALM. Um, and we have Hostos Community Gallery, so it just keeps going on and on. We've got all these institutions. But we also have, in, by 1975, the beginning of organizations begun by Puerto Ricans that want to branch out and have conversations with other Latinos. So we have the formation of the Association of Hispanic Arts. We have the Caribbean Culture Center created by Marta Vega. Marta Vega was also the first director of AHA. We have Exit Art. Uh, by, uh, founded by Papo Colo, who basically said he wanted to exit, exit from all this identity art, and we live in a, in a he's, he declares his space to be free of that and to explore hybridity. So I see him as really opening a different avenue and a discussion, a consistent discussion with the avant-garde and with an international sector of the avant-garde based in social issues, but really about larger. In many ways, he and Gino Gar and, and Gino Rodriguez don't get along at all, but <laughs> forget it. But though these spaces are sort of driving this idea that uh, being solely Puerto Rican is is not the way to go in this global society. I'm sorry, what was his name? Papa Polo. He has a. I mean, Exit Art is really one of the best galleries in New York consistently. I just can't say enough. And then, of course, the Bronx Museum. Bronx Museum uh, was founded in 1971, but when Luis Cancel takes, uh, who's Puerto Rican, who was part of the artists that were uh, gravitated towards the Gainan Gallery, Friends of Puerto Rico, he comes out of there. He was a curator there for a while. He becomes director of the Bronx Museum, and he really begins doing amazing exhibitions. One of the most important was the Latin American Spirit Show in 1988 that made a very big impression. It traveled throughout the United States. And a major catalog really discussing, you know, the contributions of Puerto Ricans and Latinos uh, to the larger discourse of art in the United States and Latin America. And finally, the Friends of Puerto Rico moves to a new space and decides to change its name yet again. It goes from Friends of Puerto Rico to Caiman Gallery, and finally to the Museum of Contemporary Hispanic Art. Another really important, um, very large space in Soho. And uh, Ilda Perraza was very good friends with, for example, with um, the founder of the new museum. So the Decade Show was one of these groundbreaking shows um, that was a collaboration, not with the Museo del Barrio, but with MOCA, the Studio Museum in Harlem, and the New Museum. And this is really, I think, when, you know, when 
artists like uh, Juan Sanchez really comes into, into, into the mainstream. It introduced a lot of very important artists that sort of became the big names in the 1990s. So this is a really important exhibition. And um, at this time also, El Museo del Barrio under Jack Aguero begins to expand. Um, so the 1980s, really, like from 75 onwards, we're really looking at Puerto Rican institutions making this bridge out to other, to other communities in New York City. It anticipates the Latino movement. And um, Tayel Boricua was also in the same building. And this is the time when Tayel Boricua and El Museo del Barrio are very closely intertwined, as they always have been, but there's, there's like a real connection. Um, and this was often seen as like the best decade. Whenever I talk to people, they have wonderful things to say about all of the parties and the workshops and, 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 and poetry readings that happened either at Dayel or El Museo or both places. Um, it was freewheeling uh, kind of times. People lived there, squatted there, squatted the building. Um, I love hearing about that. I wish I were old enough to have participated in it. Um, and here is, of course, uh, what happened with Dayel is that they were making changes in the building and they were really smart and they got the Parks Department to, they traded their space in the building for a um, brownstone in a barrio. So they had that space. But they also had joined a program two years before to create artist housing. And um, I have some documents here. So they were also, they had also taken a brownstone building, uh, a tenement building on 106th Street. So they have the brownstone and they have a tenement. A uh, tenement building which they created a gallery and, they all, and then they got involved with the community board to stop the creation of a homeless shelter in this former public school. So Tayel Boricua really turned the corner in El Barrio in terms of making 106th Street sort of that founding institution of, of the corridor. And lastly, we've got the 1990s in my book, which is going to be called the Diaspora Rican Era. And um, that's Platano Pride 2006 by uh, Miguel Luciano, who's in the audience. I'll let him talk about his work himself. But he and I have uh, people like um, uh, Yasmin Hernandez, uh, that's Dilcia Pagan, um, former political prisoner, but people also don't know that she's a wonderful filmmaker and artist. Um, that's an exhibition that I curated that Miguel was in, Yasmin Hernandez was in. We're really, the last chapter really looks at, at the 90s and the 2000s and you know, what is Diaspora Week and what, what does that mean? Uh, and that's it. That's the book and that's the beginning of the conversation. Forthcoming. Forthcoming. It should be out by September 2010. I want it to be out for Antaya um, Boricua's um, 40th anniversary. Uh, we have some time for uh, questions. Uh, yeah. 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 I have to warn you, I'm going to stand in that door and no one goes out without signing the paper sheet. And we need your, uh, your email. Okay, so please. Uh, now, uh, what I'd like to do is have a, a you know, a two and a half minutes. Yeah. And then if Uh, we're building a collection and we have quite a few things. So why don't you start, let me ask you, what is it that we have so that the public knows what they can come and do with our uh, collection for scholarship and for exhibits and for community, uh, in just in the graphic department, we'll, if you can just say that. Well, I mean, I've identified, honestly, about 100 posters that have, and, and, and these posters become more meaningful to me as I do more research. Like New Rican Village or the Latin Insomniacs, I had no idea what that really was. I mean, of course, I, I, every time I read something, all, it jumps out at me, oh, why didn't I see this before? This is really significant. So, um, yeah, there's about 900 posters that we have in the collection. And they, yes. Well, no, I propose what uh, it's ever, yeah. um, you know, maybe, and also I propose what we are doing. I, too, am an art historian, and I'm currently working on writing the catalog raisonné of 
Port de Soto, mm -hmm. uh, and I had gotten a small grant from Centro to to start that, and I hope to be able to continue it. Uh, this is the second grant I have gotten. I've actually gotten another grant from the Rothschild Foundation, which permitted me to start the work. Um, I want uh, to ask you a question. You know, it's a professional question. I've noticed that there are a number of posters that are shined, Taller Boricua, mm -hmm. and um, they are with the Jorge Soto folios, and um, they're dated 1974. Mm -hmm. um, I will accept them uh, as an art historian, as by Jorge Soto, because there is a treatment of line that is identical to his signature lines in pieces that, you know, follow that, you know, those particular uh, periods. Um, can you address that issue? No. You have no way of... of uh... Without asking, I mean, I'm not, I'm not a connoisseur. I don't, connoisseurship is not my, it's not my specialty. I'm a, I really see myself as a social historian, number one. Okay. So, you know, for me to tell you that I can identify a line in a, in a poster um, is not something that I could necessarily do. That's more what connoisseurs do, like yourself. So, um, that, you know, given that also, I'm not the person who put together any of the posters. So any questions like that about like their origin, all of that would have to be Pedro Juan Hernandez. Um, or um, someone in the library, because I don't, I cannot go downstairs and just like open up drawers and look at stuff. That doesn't, that's not the way the, uh, the center that's works. Center works center no works. way, no way. So um, I really, when I worked on the poster show at El Museo del Barrio, in which I looked at the whole collection myself, and um, some colleagues. I was able to go through each and every drawer, but um, we have like that we have here. thumbnail uh, images of all the posters in the database that have about four thousand graphics, and it's you know it's tedious to search. But we're in the process of digitizing, you know, with a very high resolution, at least the thousand pieces that we think are the most important ones, and we're also acquiring, you know, quote unquote. We're not quite sure about that. Uh, uh, software that can search through graphics so that scholars can use that. But that's, we're just beginning all that. We did acquire, you know, thanks to Jasmine and uh, Council uh, Woodman, uh, uh, who is this that funded this? Uh, no, that is. Uh, no, no, no. Rosie Mendes. Rosie Mendes funded some very expensive equipment to do the digitization. So we're in the process of doing that. The, by the way, just for your own benefit, I think it's good for you to know that what I'm working on will be a digital catalog, as it will take many years, so that at least the Jorge Soto work is singularized from the rest of the collection. But hopefully it's that's the next step for all this work, to, to make it available to write from the people. Questions to that? Actually, can can I can you share some of the way that you mapped out the Puerto Rican move? That's why I had you do the exercise because I want to hear from all of you what what, what institutions were or were not in your um, the way that you mapped your understanding of the Puerto Rican movement. That's what I wanted. I, I really wanted to hear like how do people see it? Arlene. Let's, Focus on institutions. Okay. Uh, what I did was I put New York and Art Central, and I thought of it as a multi dimensional space where there's overlapping and open ended spaces that blend into one another in one context and get closed in other contexts. So, as to understand New York and Art as inclusive and at the same time. Um, excluded by other art movements. That makes sense. Sure. So, so then, New York Rican art is at the center, but then um, it overlaps with Puerto Rican art that's island oriented. It overlaps with Chicano art. It overlaps with African American art. It overlaps 
political and intersexual poetry and literature produced by New Americans and African Americans. Um, it also overlaps with the history of African art and Latin American art, and then more broadly within the context of European art. And again, all of those overlappings are ex at once inclusive and, and exclusionary. Anyone else? Libertad, what did you, I have to want to call out. Miguel, you have to go next. <laughs> Sorry. Mine was a mental geography, not about institutions, but more about that uh, connection between what you probably call the Jacobite as Puerto Rican. Since, you know, 10 years ago, I lived it from the perspective of Puerto Rico, and now being here 10 years, and how, like, it gets, the New York scene gets seen from both sides. Uh, so it, it was more an abstract thing about a in the center and, and, and the flux of uh, influence between Island and Maine and New York basically, not really many New York and how, like, depending on where, you, where you're stepping, you see it's completely different but always overlapping in a way. Miguel. <laughs> uh, I my map also was not uh, institutional in so much. Uh, it didn't make total sense. It was a more of a personal map where uh, I guess where I sort of caught up with uh, the Puerto Rican art in my own life, right? Where I experienced it. Not, not beginning in New York. You know? So from, oh, from the island to Florida to New York and to sort of northeast the communities I've connected with. Um, you know, the remaining Puerto Rican cultural institutions that are in New York and sort of the Northeast, you know, Chicago, Philadelphia, and sort of places. So it was more of a personal map of my own trajectory, I guess, too, in, in doing my own research. What I find interesting also is once you're here, like the world is, is like what you mentioned, very much by neighborhood. And again, like one may, may think of Puerto Rico and then New York, but then within New York, there's very different scenes, like you were mentioning, like even the real great society uptown versus the one up, uh, downtown versus uptown, had a very different ethos and, and agenda and, and sort of that, and I think it would be interesting for you to mention that we're gonna have the Lois Saida conference with this <laughs> <laughs> Because it explores that version of the avant-garde and the community building and the, like, the spatialness of, of things. Uh, at a point where right now art is so much uh, joined with city and with neighborhood. Like every neighborhood renewal is usually linked to art. And how much, like, because Puerto Rican art was so much linked to activism, how much of a role it had. And, and that center sponsoring uh, a conference and very much linked it to your book, you know, uh, with people that are here, that it's gonna like try to recreate that archival process of how history gets made. When you I clarify that quote, what? When, when is the conference? It's, 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 it's the 18th of November and the 20th of November. It, it's going to be in Clemente Soto Vélez Center, okay. Cultural Center. Sorry. Uh -huh. Yeah, I, I, I can't like, so acknowledge that, so I didn't really participate in this uh, survey gang. I wanted to just ask you, uh, firstly, I, the, the title, the Illustrated History of the Puerto Rican Art Movement. So I, I just wanted to have a better sense because they're, they're spanning like several decades and there's, it seems like it's, you call it a movement. And so I just wanted to ask you why you called it a movement. Oh, because in the book, I really, I demonstrate that there's a, a great deal of um, intersection among artists. There's a constant dialogue and there was a movement to create. It's part of the alternative art movement in New York, and it's to create community-based galleries that were not necessarily part of the mainstream. There was an actual movement with manifestos, and so I trace it all the way back to 1964. Right? Um, but I also use a model that's about collaborative circles so that you kind of see how artists that work with each other to create various different kinds of organizations. But it's all about linking, linking generations and linking artists from the neighborhood it, to neighborhood. Like, like more contemporary artists, are, some of the, the older ones that participated in the 70s, of mm -hmm. course, they're going to be conscious on some level that mm -hmm. there was this kind of activism, artistic activism. 
I was just wondering, because I never heard anyone really articulate that in that manner to say that the artists working today are necessarily conscious that they're part of this like larger sweep of a movement. Because I always think of a movement of seeing as being something that's conscious. And certainly in the 70s, you had that, you had the manifestos and blah, blah, blah. And uh, an aesthetic also in this post art that really comes to the fore. But then, um, just, I just find like when you get into the uh, late, into the 90s and mm -hmm. stuff, that idea, or even the late 80s, mm -hmm. like the idea of being in a movement sort of starts vanishing. Sort well, of, or, you know. Or it becomes I, more dispersed. It does. That's why the last part of the diaspora in decade. But I actually did that because someone like yourself or, or someone like Wanda or Miguel, I see a lot of resonances between the work to the 1970s and to what I believe is like the ethos of building, of bridging gaps and building community. And I got that really from looking at Wanda's, some of Wanda's latest performances. So um, it just seems that the way we operate um, and our, the organizations that we form, for the most part, still have this notion of being community-based. Uh, and um, that becomes an important part of what I think distinguishes the kind of work that we do and gives it a certain amount of validity, even though for most people, they, most historians say that is no longer evident after 1988 in the mainstream. But I think it's still very alive for us. Yes. Uh, I actually lived through all of this. Mm -hmm. So from the very earliest to the very latest, mm -hmm. you know, I had intimate uh, relationships with it. One thing that you said mm -hmm. was uh, in discussing, for example, the Galeria Campeche and Guayer Campeche, and you also hinted at it when you spoke about friends of Puerto Rico. You, but you didn't mention, and maybe, you know, it's just an oversight, or maybe you do go into it in your book, but that the real separation between one, e.g., the so-called New Yorkan versus the Puerto Rican island-oriented was class differences. Do you, do you touch on that at all in your uh, book? Class is pretty much a, you know, class is at the root of what I what I study and I, I deal with the working, you know, I, I discuss it as coming out of out of the working class. Yeah. But uh, I know But then a gallery like let's say Campeche or Yer mm -hmm. or Yer Campeche uh, as being, you know, Puerto Rican centered but really being about class differences. I don't really see that, I'm sorry. Oh okay, fine. No, I mean it was I think that that's still some of the prejudice about the migration division that I don't understand because the people who were running a lot of the migration division were themselves from working class groups. I mean, you know, it's it's sort of like it's almost like when you join an organization and you and you work with an organization for a while, you just become like you lose your individuality and you become part of this like they had their jazz. When I was at the museo, but it's part of the museo, you want to go hablar, and now I'm at the center. People talk to me in a different way. It's like. I really, when I look at who's working at the migration division, these are working class Puerto Ricans. No son elitistas de la isla que vienen aquí a hacer así. Irving McManus worked there, and I don't see him as part of the elite, right? I mean, these are, I, I don't, I, I, I want to approach this really from, from this attitude of generosity and trying to really understand that everyone is in the same boat in some way or another. Can I, can I uh, ask, ask the same question in a slightly different way? Mm -hmm. Isn't it true that the uh, art, the American art, uh, to a large extent, was community rooted as opposed to, let's say, the galleries in Puerto Rico and the, the elites that actually sustain certain type of artists to, uh, uh, you know, in their art, and you know, for more valuable than others and so forth. And to some extent, there might be some uh, class uh, uh, differences or different financial supports to artists, uh, the artists that you described, and some other artists. Uh, Puerto Rico, there are a lot of working class and, and, and kind of community rooted artists as well. Yeah. But there are others that, you know, they crack the mainstream and, 
and support. So I'm not, not sure whether that's what he's referring to. I mean, personally, I all I can tell you is that I'm so rooted in this that so I wouldn't really know about that world. I mean, the, honestly, I, when I went to Puerto Rico, I found it very telling that when they did the first the first um, art fair, that certain collectors decided not decided to show like their collection of American and German art and not necessarily their, and I wasn't invited to, to that. Anyway. The support system for the artists is different based on, on the markets and the Sure, origins. I think Miguel could speak to this much better because I'm really not a person who looks at markets in that way. He would, could you speak to this? I, uh, yeah, I'm not, I mean, I'm not an expert in the Puerto Rican art market either. It's like, it's a, but it's, it still it still works differently for, for, for artists I think uh, who are based in New York versus Long Island and there's just there's different there's still different communities there's a lot of overlap in those communities but I think you know following up with uh, what uh, Judy was talking about there's I for me like I feel a, 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 a clear sort of link um, to the trajectory of New York art history and and how it influences my work, the way I think, you know, right? My connection to the community, my work as an educator, and so on. And, and there, are, there are a number of other artists who I think uh, who are clearly sort of linked to that history. You know, I mean, it's part of the one of the, one of the reasons that I came to New York was actually to connect my work with that history. Um, and uh, at the same time, I have I, I have a lot of friends who are from the island came here to study. Uh, for postgraduate studies, and I've since gone back to the island, some of them stay here, but their their history, their work, their audience, their community is very different. And uh, it's not that we're not interested in supporting some of the same things ideologically, but we, we're influenced by different mm -hmm. histories. And so, um, in terms of uh, how the artists identify with the movement, I think it is an interesting question, you know, um, because I feel like connected to that movement, that history, and feel like it's, it, there is a big question mark in terms of how it's continued today and how I think contemporary artists experience that community. Mm -hmm. um, but all of these things, I think, help to, you know, the, the, your work legitimizes a history that has been stigmatized for a long time. And it's still sort of recognized with, uh, I think, a certain amount of, uh, I, I don't know if contempt is kind of a, a strong word, but it's, it's not, uh, it's, it's not recognized with legitimacy uh, here nor on the island, you know? It, 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 it's not given the importance that it should. And so it helps to bridge, I think, those those stories. And, and it helps, I'm looking at it from the, my generation's perspective of how it helps us to still uh, discuss, negotiate, and connect on a number of things that have not happened completely still, you know? Talk to us. No, I was going to say, you know, we're all looking forward to the book because it's going to be groundbreaking. It's going to be really, really significant. Uh, I was I was wondering, though, uh, one really key thing that, that I hope will at least you begin to trace is the kind of aesthetics of the movement, mm -hmm. more so than just the, the sort of institutional and social, because uh, it's very, because that might be the thing that will push the book forward or not, uh, because, you know, historians and other people have written about, you know, uh, the social context. What has not been written about is the artistic context. So it might be interesting to, uh, I mean, you intimated it in the different areas, but I think it will be a major contribution, even if it's just the beginning, because we all know that things build on each other. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, you intimated in terms of the poster art or the graffiti. You know, but uh, a little bit I think would be useful to, to begin building because I think right now, uh, in the larger context of Latino art, you know, the question is, you know, what is the aesthetic of that art? You know, uh, and so any, you know, Chicanos are dealing with it, you know, uh, Cuban Americans are dealing with it, you know, uh, so any little, you know, beginning, even if it's, you know, preliminary, would be very useful because. Then because now, for example, that there is a, a move to build the National Museum of the American Latino in Washington, you know, uh, these are the questions that 
will be very useful to you know to, to be be the building block for whatever's going to be going to that national museum. I, I agree. The, the problem is, is that there's there's no one aesthetic. There's several. Yeah. I would say Dayen Boricua, Arte Boricua have the strongest, most visible aesthetic that I can trace. Um, but then you have, you know, the, you know, what do we have in performance? Um, I think performance, art, the photography very, very important. I mean, I would say conceptual art. Yeah, conceptual art is really yes. one of the key things. You Absolutely. know, you mentioned four yes. really major American conceptual artists. Yes. Apo, Tino, I mean, and Gino. Yes. Uh, so that's really a key. I mean, that would be a break to show that it was, you know, actually from this uh, rooted community-based art that you had, it wasn't because they were in the community that they were not thinkers and making Absolutely. art. Absolutely. So I think those are the kinds of questions that would also be very right. important. I mean, what I stress at GIA, which is the grant makers in the arts, um, is what I admire a lot about Puerto Rican artist spaces in, in New York is that they, ne even though they were community based, they never stopped. They didn't make community art. They made by necessity because they weren't being shown in a, in, in mainstream galleries. By necessity, they made. You know, you, you were seeing cutting edge art <laughs> at all times. Was, they were primarily art. They were fine artists. And so you had like conceptual shows in a little gallery in El Barrio. And, and the community, I remember being asked, well, will the community relate to this? And I was like, don't underestimate community people. You know, they are going to like rise to the occasion. They're going to bring things to it. So that's something I constantly uh, uh, confront which a skepticism that a community-based gallery can also be avant-garde, and that's something that I stress throughout the book, that this is work that is extremely valid, interesting, um, and groundbreaking. So I agree. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I also, when I, when I asked the question about the movement, that wasn't really a, a criticism, actually. Mm -hmm. uh, it was an observation of, of, of an attempt to really uh, embrace our presence in this country, and as well as the dialogue we're having with uh, our roots in Puerto Rico. So uh, I want to make that clear. Also, I, I just also want to look at um, this idea of the aesthetics, of course, and, and the complexity of that. If you're looking at so many decades and you're looking at artists who may be very diverse, even though they identify themselves as Puerto Rican, that's a very broad category. Um, and then uh, so I, I just want to. You know, I understand that as a major challenge, also because I, I experienced that in film. You know, what, the discussion of aesthetics rather than our, our social presence and how our artists articulate our issues. Um, um, I wanted to raise a, a couple of more questions, in, especially when we're coming to the the, the present. One is. Um, Again, because I, I wasn't here earlier, so I apologize. The the idea of uh, artists who work in, in new media, mm -hmm. the uh, artists who work in film, not necessarily uh, conventional, commercial, industrial films that we're used to, but the artists, that, the, the, the filmmakers that are working more in, in more avant-garde or challenging modes, and whether you address any of that. Because they were also part of these movements, too. I, I do. Um the problem really is for me that we really don't have a his, you know, any kind of a history. So I'm creating a chronology. And when you say like, why did I call it illustrating, you know, the Puerto Rican movement? Because alongside the book, I'm. The, I want to commit Centro, and, and we already are sort of committed to um, creating a couple of timelines, you know based on the collection, augmented, in which we can explore, you know, a lot of the specifics that happen in each in each year. And I think that complexity will come out, hopefully, in the timelines. I am committed to creating a time specifically for Dayan Boricua, for the 40th. Um, and if you just look at all of the kind of experimentation that took place there. But to answer your direct question, yes, there's a part which is called Confronting Realidades. Because even here, I mean, this was a long lecture. 
uh, I think, all of you, and I didn't get to half of what the book is going to deal with. In, in the portion called Confronting Realidades is where I discuss the filmmakers vis-a-vis -vis channel, uh, channel 13 presentation Realidades that allowed a lot of our exper experimental filmmakers, performance artists, to kind of get that first main, you know, first attention. But each, each thing, because ge geography, I'm going to touch on everything, I have to just create a diagram and the second book, you know, the follow-up can kind of, and hopefully many more of you will begin writing about this because I certainly am not, I'm not uh, capable of doing it all. I'm just trying to do the basic. I know, we're going <laughs> to... You know, I mean, every day I would write my dissertation, I would always say, just strive to do the mediocre. I'm just striving for mediocrity to get this right now. And then later on it's revised. <laughs> <laughs> but do you do you cover do you cover like new media and like, like no I, new media not yet at all I, diaspora week and decade I, I everything has been mentioned like right now we yeah the diaspora week and decade you gotta I gotta come up with stuff to to you know format it it's really hard 